Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you very much uh, for joining us tonight. Uh, I wish you a very warm welcome back to the Center for International Relations in Sustainable Development. We are now in the 10th year of our work here in Serbia and uh, around the world. We are continuing with our uh, mission, and that is to uh, help uh, the Balkans uh, make a better sense of uh, what is going on in the world. Uh, I remember 10 years ago when uh, there was a founding event in Belgrade. Uh, we did have a very special guest, uh, the guest that is uh, our guest as well of this evening, uh, one of the founding members of the Center for International Relations and Sustainable Development. But tonight we're here to celebrate the uh, coming out of print of the 22nd volume of our journal, Journal of International Relations and Sustainable Development, uh, which in the meantime, I'm very proud to say, uh, has become the only Southeast Europe's uh, academic publication that is available on JSTOR, uh, which is a big deal, and uh, we're very proud of it. Uh, of course, thanks uh, to the range of great authors that have been writing for us, including in this issue, the 22nd volume, which speaks about the winter of our discontent. Uh, the winter of dissatisfaction, the winter of lack of motion throughout the world. Uh, but uh, I'm going to say a few words uh, at this stage uh, about our guest uh, for, uh, tonight. And uh, I am not going to make an exaggeration if I say that what Novak Djokovic is for tennis, uh, Jeffrey Sachs is for sustainable development. And that's simply the greatest of all times. I was enormously privileged uh, to have Jeffrey Sachs as my mentor in graduate school. He was my mentor at Harvard. Um, he, uh, at the age of 26, uh, joined Harvard faculty. At uh, the age of 28, he became tenured professor, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the youngest uh, tenured professor at that time in Harvard's history. Uh, New York Times uh, called him probably the most important economist in the world. He's a world-renowned intellectual, best-selling author, innovative educator, and uh, widely recognized for bold and effective strategies to address uh, complex challenges, including um, escape from extreme poverty, the global battle against human-induced climate change, uh, and so on. He's currently university professor at Columbia uh, University, uh, where he's also the director of the Center for Sustainable Development. Um, he uh, is also president of the UN Sustainable Development uh, Na Solutions Network and a member of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences at the Vatican. Uh, Jeffrey Sachs served as advisor to three consecutive Secretary Generals of the United Nations, to Kofi Annan, to Ban Ki-moon, and then to Antonio Guterres. Uh, he also served to one as an advisor to a president of the UN General Assembly in 2012 and 2013. I was privileged to have Jeffrey Sachs as my advisor. I was also privileged to have Jeffrey Sachs uh, on my side as a senior member of my campaign team when I ran for Secretary General in 2016. He's the author of uh, numerous books, some of which uh, did become global uh, bestsellers, uh, he's the recipient of the 2022 prestigious Tang Prize in Sustainable Development. And um, uh, there are so many things I can say about Jeff, but this is the one last piece that I'm going to say. Uh, he received 41 honorary doctorates from universities around the world. So when I compared him to Novak Djokovic's 22 Grand Slam titles, I didn't have this statistic in mind. So 41 times honorary doctorate uh, for our guest of tonight. And last but not least, he was the chairman of Lancet Commission. Uh, Lancet, one of the most famous scientific uh, journals in the world, created a big commission 
on the lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic, which is something that I'm sure we're going to touch upon in our conversation tonight. So uh, without further ado, uh, I ask you to join me in a warm welcome our guest of tonight, Professor Jeffrey Sachs. Wow, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and Fook. It's so wonderful to be back here because we've had fantastic discussions over the last 10 years here. And uh, please know how incredibly innovative CIRSD is and how incredibly uh, foresighted it was of Vuk to put together the two themes of international relations and sustainable development. He had a little bit of an inside track because he led for the whole world the sustainable development initiative which brought us the sustainable development goals so that's quite a historic contribution but uh, Vuk knew then as a world leading diplomat engaged in sustainable development that success in saving the planet was going to depend on success of geopolitics and um, whether we can be successful is still hanging in the balance. So we came together, you invited me kindly 10 years ago in this forum, this venue, uh, where we uh, celebrated your idea of launching CIRSD and, and this publication. Then uh, a year after that, we discussed one of the most poignant uh, and uh, difficult topics in modern history, and that was the origins of World War I, something that this region knows all too well. And of course, the, the backdrop of that discussion that we had in 2014 was, can we avoid sleepwalking into disaster again in the 21st century? And who would have thought that we would be meeting again this evening when that question is uh, actually front and center for the whole world because I think it's a backdrop to our discussion, just one very sobering point and I'm eager to speak with you tonight uh, about it. Um, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, which uh, many of you will have heard of, uh, in 1947 established something called the Doomsday Clock, which is uh, also called the minutes to midnight clock. And the idea of these atomic scientists was that they knew back in 1947 that they had, through the brilliance of their science, created something that for the first time in human history could really destroy humanity. And they sensed that it was a danger unlike anything that humanity had ever experienced before, because while humanity is able to kill each other in large numbers and has done so throughout history, having a weapon that could end the planet was something different. And so they made this doomsday clock. And when they launched it in 1947, they put it at seven minutes to midnight, seven minutes to disaster. and. Over the years since 1947, the clock has generally moved a little closer to midnight because the weapons became more and more powerful. And because a few years ago they told the world that it's not just nuclear war, but it's environmental catastrophe that could also doom humanity. But at some points, such as the end of the Cold War, the hand was moved back from midnight several minutes. And for me, that's very poignant because what we're going to discuss tonight in my professional life started 34 years ago when I became an advisor in this region to Ante Markovic uh, in uh, federal Yugoslavia in 1989 and to the Solidarity Movement in Poland and to Mikhail Gorbachev. Uh, his economic team 
uh, for the Soviet Union. <coughs> and we thought then, 30 plus years ago, that the tensions would be reduced. And that uh, Gorbachev, who for me is a hero, even though he's reviled by many in, in his own country, I, I think through a deep misunderstanding, but in any event, for me, he's a hero because he was a person of peace. And uh, maybe that's in a way why the Soviet Union ended, because he did not want to use force to hold things together. He wanted to use persuasion. But be that as it may, his idea was that there could be a peaceful, common European home. That was his great idea. And I signed up for that. I thought that really is a wonderful idea and a wonderful way to spend one's effort and one's time. And I got stuck with that idea 34 years ago, and I'm still completely stuck with it today. So I'm deeply frustrated by what's happening. And what we're going to discuss a bit is how we got from those uh, very optimistic days to today. But just to make the point, what was seven minutes to midnight in 1947, and then was, uh, I think, 12 or even more minutes to midnight when they put the hands back further from disaster, is now, as of last week, 90 seconds to midnight. What the scientists are saying to us is a minute and a half to disaster. And what they're conveying by their announcement last week is that we are on the threshold of nuclear war, again, for the first time in 60 years since the Cuban Missile Crisis. And it's some ways more ominous now even than 60 years ago because there's a hot war to start with. And this is a war between the United States and Russia, have no doubt, even though the soldiers dying in Ukraine are Ukrainian soldiers, the weapon systems and the intelligence and the sighting and uh, the finance is all the United States and its allies. So this is a war between Russia and the United States already. And you don't want that between two nuclear superpowers. So that's the kind of grim occasion that we meet this <laughs> evening. So, well, thank you, Jeff, for, for this introduction. And, and as a matter of fact, I was, uh, I was planning on uh, asking you this as a first question because this is obviously uh, the biggest issue that is dominating uh, the world uh, headlines and that is occupying most of the energy and, uh, and oxygen in a room when you talk about the world politics. Uh, but you did remind me of uh, this uh, big event that we organized together in 2014 on the 100th anniversary of the outbreak of the First World War. And, uh, and there were people, including Christopher Clark, who was, uh, who was our guest back then, who, who claimed that, uh, that the First World War actually started by uh, the assassination um, of uh, the Archduke in Sarajevo. And obviously others uh, gave it a little bit of a different perspective that there was a bigger issue at stake. So um, I'm going to use this as a, uh, as a way to enter my first question, the war in Ukraine. The war between the United States, as you say, and, and Russia, the proxy war that is being fought on the territory of Ukraine. How do you see the origins of this conflict? How did we get here? Why are we on the precipice of a disaster uh, 90 seconds from midnight on the doomsday clock, if you will? Yeah, I think it's uh, exactly uh, the right analogy. W when, when did World War I start? Did it start on June 28th with the assassination of the Archduke? Did it start on July 28th with the declaration of war uh, against, by uh, Austria against Serbia? Did it start 10 years earlier when military alliances were secretly made that led to the triggering of disaster? Of course, there are roots to any conflict. And uh, even the dating that we give to the Ukraine war in most of the Western media is simply false on its surface, but it also disguises the, the antecedent causes. This war started in February 2014. 
we say it started in February 2022, typically, uh, that Putin, uh, without provocation, because he's a madman uh, and wanted to recreate the Russian Empire in his fantasies, launched an unprovoked war on February 24th, 2022. That's just propaganda. That's uh, not even factual about when the fighting started, because the fighting started in 2014, not in 2022. And it raged, actually, between 2014 and 2022. So even the simple fact of when the war started was that it started eight years earlier. And of course, why the war started eight years earlier is heavily contested, but I'll give you my five minute view. And that is that from 1990 onward, we failed to endorse, adopt, and build on Gorbachev's vision of a common European home. And instead, the US set up a vision of a US-led unipolar world and believed that the Cold War was won by a US victory rather than achieved by a diplomatic settlement. In fact, the US did not defeat the Soviet Union. Gorbachev unilaterally said, we should end the Cold War. We want to reform. We're going to disband the Warsaw Pact because we don't want to address our issues through military means. And he was told in 1990, OK, if you do that, Germany wants to reunify, but we commit to not expanding our military alliance, NATO, in place of what was the Warsaw Pact. And a famous promise was made that we will not move NATO one inch eastward. And by the way, I always like to say in my talks, if you want documentary evidence, my email is sachs at columbia.edu, and I'll be happy to refer you to the archival material that documents this, because this is all denied now by the United States, which likes a politics of amnesia rather than a politics of memory in this case. So the US promised no NATO enlargement. By 1992, the neoconservatives in the United States, which means the hawkish or war party, uh, was in power. Uh, remember Cheney, Wolfowitz, uh, and uh, Rumsfeld. Uh, and then they were followed by the Democratic Party side of the war party, which is uh, Madeleine Albright, Richard Holbrook, and others. So it's both parties. It's not one party or another party. They said, no, no, we won. It's a unipolar world. Anyway, Soviet Union's finished. We don't have any commitments to keep. And so Bill Clinton started the NATO enlargement in the mid-1990s. And really smart people knew at the time, this is reckless. This is dangerous. It's a cheat, and it's also a provocation. And so that went on for a long time. By the way, when President Putin came to power in 1999, he was not anti-European. He was not anti-American. He expected cooperation. But he said, stop the NATO enlargement, because you know we have interests, and we don't want your military on our border. Then came 9-11. The neocons went into absolute preeminence. Cheney basically ran the security state of the United States from 2001 to 2008. He was a very dangerous person. Uh, he said, if there's 1% risk of something, you have to treat it like it's a 100% chance. You know, if Saddam has 1% chance of, nuclear, of having nuclear weapons, you have to treat it like it's certainty. 
That's a little crazy, by the way, in decision analysis. You don't treat a 1% as 100%, but you do create a lot of wars if you do that. So all the wars started. And the NATO enlargement continued in 2004, seven more countries. The Baltic states, Romania, Bulgaria, Slovenia, and Slovakia. And then in 2007, Putin said, no more. So George W. Bush in 2008 said, yes, more. Ukraine and Georgia. This was not prudent. Prudence, prudencia, is a Latin word meaning practical good judgment. And it comes from a Greek word called sophrosyne, which means wisdom. This is not wisdom. This is stupid. And that's what they announced in Bucharest 2008. And many European leaders said to me at the time, what is he doing? We're against this. But one thing, this is the continuing slide into this, and I'll just finish with uh, two quick points on this. In 2014, the US helped overthrow the president of Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych. We know it from many means. I know it because I happen to see things that I wish I hadn't seen. But the US was part of this overthrow. Putin didn't like that either. Because Yanukovych was actually rather cleverly trying to balance two giants. On the one side, the West saying, you must do this and you must do that. On the other side, Russia saying, you must do this and must do that. And Yanukovych's position was, we're neutral. Thank you, we're neutral. That was rather intolerable to the United States. Neutrality doesn't work in the US mindset because you're either with us or you're against us. And so they helped to overthrow him in February 2014. That's when the war started. And between 2014 and 2021, there was fighting the whole time, but the US put in billions of dollars of weaponry. And the Ukrainians built fortifications along this line that we're seeing the front line. That didn't just start a few months ago. That was eight years of fortifying the eastern Ukraine with American finance and know-how and weaponry. So at the end of 2021, after Biden had come into office, Putin said, look, you crossed every red line, but our red line is NATO stops its enlargement. You stop trying to get military bases on our borders. You stop putting weapon systems that can hit us in a few minutes, and we discuss it. And the White House answer was, nothing to discuss. And we're certainly not going to talk about NATO enlargement. And then the war, the invasion came on February 24th, 2022. So if ever there was a series of missed opportunities over 30 years to avoid a conflict, this is it. And that's why I'm deeply unimpressed by an analysis that said this war started on February 24th, 2022 by an unprovoked attack by President Putin. It's just not true. It started because of a buildup of conflict over a 30-year period and lots of cheating, I'm afraid, by the United States side. And that brings us to our mess right now. So we are, we are Jeff, uh, where we are right now. And uh, obviously, this angle is, uh, is something that is uh, fiercely opposed by uh, official capital views of, of, of the European Union and, uh, and Washington as well. But uh, the fact of life is that a uh, set of very harsh economic sanctions uh, were imposed on the Russian Federation unilaterally by the United States and the European Union. And uh, as a both economist and an intellectual, what's your take on 
these sanctions not effective. Those are some, opposites, by the way, economist and intellectual. And intellectual. <laughs> well, try to, make the point. Try, try to be both in, in answering this, but uh, and, and why do you think that uh, majority of world nations uh, don't seem to have been ready to uh, support this uh, course of action, at least not so far? First on the sanctions, you know, the United States uses sanctions a lot. It's an interesting policy. They use it a lot because it's uh, without any direct budget outlay and it can do a lot of damage. And it doesn't require any public debate. It doesn't require any congressional approval. The public doesn't even understand what it is, but who cares, it's not their business. This is purely the president by signing, uh, by signing a document. And the US uses these unilateral sanctions. This is different from sanctions approved by the UN. That's a different matter because the Security Council can vote sanctions under the UN Charter. But this is the US using its sanctions, and they do it a lot. The one thing I would observe about this is they almost never work in geopolitical terms. And I've watched for years the use of sanctions by the US as a cheap, easy policy fail time and again. One was the United States <laughs> in one of the most ridiculous foreign policy uh, moves you can imagine, suddenly decided under Trump to declare that the president of Venezuela wasn't the president, but the president that the United States said was the president. So the United States one day announced uh, Maduro is not president, Guaido is president. It's, it's, in English we would slang, we would say pretty ballsy. Uh, that you just announce one day who the other country's president actually is. It's a strange kind of foreign policy. Anyway, they said, okay, since Maduro's not president, he can't have any access to foreign exchange reserves anymore. He can't uh, fix, uh, Venezuela won't be allowed to fix its uh, oil drilling and so forth. So by stroke of a pen, they put on these unilateral sanctions. It actually worked in one sense. It completely crushed the Venezuelan economy, which declined by more than 50% in GDP, ex extraordinary decline. What didn't work is Maduro's still there, of course. Not, and Guaido, by the way, was thrown out even by the opposition saying, no, no, he's not our president anymore. The whole thing was absurd. It was worse than a high school play, actually. Oh, you're not student council president? He is. Yeah, but he won the vote. No, it doesn't matter. But anyway, they did this, but it didn't work geopolitically. It didn't end Maduro's government. In fact, in a way, he said, look, all this economic crisis caused by the gringos in the north, which was pretty accurate description, <laughs> after all. It was uh, the United States that did this. So now, by the way, the White House sends its emissaries to Maduro. Would you pump more oil because we have to replace the Russian oil? So now they're trying to become buddies with Maduro again. But the point is, it didn't work. And no US sanctions regime that I know of in recent years has come close to working. So that's a starting point. So as soon as the US put on sanctions on Russia, I talked to a very senior official and I said, you know, this isn't going to work. It, it doesn't work. This time it was worse though, because not only did it not cripple the Russian economy, the boomerang effect, which didn't apply in Venezuela so much, because you could crush Venezuela without the whole world feeling it, applied in the case of Russia, which is it's led to tremendous global negative consequences. So it didn't stop Russia from exporting all over the world. And I'll come to your question, why? But it also hurt Europe a lot because Europe's told, no, you can't, uh, you can't buy the 
low-cost energy that your industry has built upon. So it, the, the effects were quite serious and we haven't seen the last of those effects yet. But when the sanctions were imposed, it was the US and always the Anglo-Saxon world. So that's the US, Canada, UK, Australia, New Zealand. That's a block of the security system of the US. Then the EU, okay? Then Japan, Korea, and Singapore. That's basically it. That's roughly 20% or so of the world population, roughly speaking. Maybe a little bit less, actually. And most of the rest of the world said, mm, we don't want to get into this. We trade with Russia. We trade with Ukraine. We're not party to this conflict. We think this conflict should stop with negotiations. And so most of the world does not want this. Of course, a lot of the world's afraid of the US secondary sanctions. But the vast majority of the world doesn't agree with these sanctions and doesn't even agree with the idea that any country can just decide to impose these sanctions, which are illegal in international law, after all. There's no legal basis for one country to say, stop trading with all those other countries. You can't do that. But they're a little afraid, but they don't impose the sanctions. This is the basic reason why Russian economy has done fine during the past year, because China trades with Russia, India trades with Russia, all the Asian countries trade with Russia, the Latin American countries trade with Russia. Today, Chancellor Schultz has, has been in South America, and he's being told by the South American leaders, don't pull us into this. We're not going to send arms to Ukraine. They trade with Russia, but they also trade with Ukraine, by the way. They don't want to be in this proxy war. So that's the main reason. And they don't view it like the US thought automatically they would view it, that this is an unprovoked attack. I speak to world leaders all over the world, and they understand full well this is a confrontation of two superpowers, not one side launching a war. And they want both sides to back off. So that's and that's, my, the, that's the answer. So that is, my, that is my next question. We're obviously in a very dangerous situation. Uh, this had a very negative effect with the world economy, probably not as negative for Russia as, uh, as the West uh, had initially expected. But, but it's definitely a bad thing, uh, causing uh, global inflation, disrupting global chains and all that. We're going to get into that in a moment. But, uh, but just to finish off the... the the war section, uh, what do you believe needs to be done under the circumstances? And who, in your opinion, uh, should provide leadership for this tragedy uh, to be brought to a halt? I believe that in December 2021, the, the way that this war would have been avoided was three steps. One was Ukraine's neutrality, so non-NATO, neutral, number one. Number two, that Russia would continue to hold Crimea, whether by agreement or de facto. Russia views Crimea as a particular matter of national security for a true reason, which is that since 1783, that's the place of its naval base in the Black Sea, and that is central to Russia's national security. And I think that that's true. And the third was that the Minsk II agreement to address the Donbas would be implemented. And the Minsk II agreement came in 2014 and 2015 after the events of 2014 to give autonomy to the Donbas. And that's where the heavy Russian-speaking population is, and that's the site of the war right now. 
and the idea was that there would be some kind of constitutional autonomy, and this was signed by Ukraine and guaranteed by Germany and France in the so-called Normandy process. It was never implemented. My Ukrainian counterparts tell me, of course we would never implement that. It was, we signed it, yes, but we would never implement it. A few weeks ago, Ch former Chancellor Merkel, who was a guarantor of the agreement, said, she said, I don't even know whether it's true now what she said or what she said then. She said, no, no, it was a, it, it was a holding period uh, to strengthen, to allow Ukraine to strengthen itself. We didn't expect it to be implemented which is a remarkable statement to make because Germany was a guarantor of the agreement. That means that they're supposed to ensure that it's implemented. Whatever the case, those three positions that Putin put on the table at the end of 2021 made sense. They really made sense because not expanding NATO, in my view, is not a concession, it's common sense. Do you actually really want to provoke a conflict or do you want to keep a safe space? I say keep a safe space. So that one wasn't a concession, that just made sense to me. Crimea makes sense to me also, I have to say, that fighting to take it back could lead us to nuclear war and we should understand the practicalities of this. And what Yanukovych was trying to do in 2011 was to negotiate a long-term lease arrangement with Russia that would last at least till 2041. Well, that would have been smart, but uh, he was under a lot of Western pressure. And then Minsk II, sign implemented. Well, we turned down that basis. So, Everything got worse. Everything's worse. Not only have hundreds of thousands of people died, we don't know how many, and massive destruction by now, but Russia annexed four regions. Okay, this makes it a lot harder. We don't even know what diplomacy would exactly mean right now, but to my mind, we remain three core issues. And the core issues are neutrality or NATO enlargement is one issue. The second issue is Crimea. And the third issue is Donbass, but unfortunately now with the Kherson region and Zaporozhye region thrown in, into this terrible uh, mix. But what does it mean in my view? It means that what this war is about is politics. It's not about some crazy, it's not about, in my opinion, Putin thinking he's Peter the Great. It's not about the Western propaganda. It's not about Hitler in 1938. It's actually about NATO and Ukraine and all these issues which have been on the table for 30 years. So we should face them politically. And this is, I think, what Clausewitz meant by his most famous expression, that war is politics with other means. In other words, we're still dealing with politics, so we need to have a political discussion about this right now. So you mentioned in one of your recent um, articles that uh, neutral countries, uh, including those of the no global south, can play an important role in this. Uh, again, the world has changed tremendously since uh, the beginning of this latest era and the history and so on and so forth. So um, you have a, a different global layout when it comes to economic power. And G7 is, is on, the, on the one hand and, and then you have BRICS and the rest of, uh, of the global south. So uh, how do you see the role of the global south in BRICS in particular, uh, in uh, balancing out the future uh, of uh, 
world, both uh, security and economy? My view is that the whole world plays a role in ending this conflict for one very basic reason. If the world really subscribed to the American and European narrative that this is an unprovoked war, that there are no issues, that Russia just needs to leave, and that it's horrendous crimes and so forth, if that were the view around the world, the whole world would have joined in the sanctions and Russia really would not have been able to carry on a war. It wouldn't have changed the regime and so forth, as I mentioned, even with Maduro. But uh, Russia has been able to do what it does because it's got friends all over the world that don't subscribe to the dominant EU-US narrative. They think everybody agrees with them, but that's basically because they listen to themselves. They're not talking with the rest of the world. I am talking with a lot of world leaders who say, yeah, this is, be, uh, this is a contest between the US and Russia. We don't want to take sides in that. So my point has always been at least make it clear that this is not a war about NATO enlargement, is what I've said to the US, for example, from December 2021 onward. Say NATO isn't enlarging, and that if Putin invades, there's no provocation for that. Make it clear. No, 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 we won't make it clear. It's, the door is open. It's an open door policy. Well, come on. They can't even win the international support on that because it's quite logical that it is a NATO enlargement war. And they don't say, uh, they won't admit that or they won't deny that. They won't say anything about it. So this is my point about why these other countries. Let's get things on the record. Is the US wanting to enlarge NATO? If they had any sense at all, they would say no. It was a terrible idea in 2008. And we understand it's a terrible idea. It crosses the red line of a major power that has 1,700 nuclear weapons. Thank you. It wasn't such a good idea. So just like in the Cuban Missile Crisis, we have a compromise to create some space exactly the way the crisis was solved 60 years ago. If they said that, and there were negotiations that made all of this clear, and the whole rest of the world said, you know, now this makes sense. And we will hold accountable the party that breaks this agreement. Then you're talking, because then just willfully invading the other side in complete contradiction to what you've agreed really would provoke a worldwide storm. And that's what I'm basically proposing, which is that there are plenty of countries that are ready to guarantee an agreement, and countries that matter. And let me take the case of China, for example. What is China's position on this war? China does not want this war. Of course, China doesn't want Russia to lose this war and NATO to win, especially because, unbelievably, the Secretary General of NATO today is in Asia to try to make a NATO-Asia alliance against China. The excuse me, what does NATO stand for? North Atlantic. Does it stand for World War III? Does it stand for US Expeditionary Force? No, it stands for North Atlantic. It was to guard against an invasion by the Soviet Union, which I guarantee is not going to happen because it doesn't exist anymore. So why is the Secretary General of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg, in Korea today? Because they have no restraint. Because now NATO wants to take a position against China, which is a kind, it's really, OK, that was I'm coming back to your question. <laughs> so what does all this mean? Put 
reasonable terms on the table, agree on reasonable terms, and then reasonable nations will help to ensure those terms. And the reason I was mentioning China is that China has said all along, we want the war to stop, which they really do, and I talk to a lot of Chinese senior officials, but we want Russia's security interests to be respected as well. In the West, that's regarded as ludicrous, but what it really means is no NATO enlargement, which is neither ludicrous nor of uninterest to China, which doesn't like NATO exactly right now, especially since they're traipsing around East Asia to try to organize an alliance against China. So all of this is to say there are lots of important countries in the world that actually want peace. And I mentioned Argentina, Brazil, India, which is president of the G20 this year, China, South Africa. They're not warmongers. They're not anti-Ukraine. They just happen also not to be anti-Russia. And they could help to guarantee a peace. But to guarantee a peace, there has to be a clear agreement. What does each side say? The US side has to say, we will not enlarge NATO. And the Russian side has to say, we will put our troops home. Those are the two points. That's observable. And I think the world could help to enforce such a basic agreement. And obviously, uh, uh, as you mentioned, BRICS uh, as, well, Russia's part of BRICS, but, yep. uh, but, but the economic equation has changed a little bit. And uh, uh, I found it fascinating today when, when you were giving this interview um, to our television when you said that, uh, I did not know that, that uh, uh, the combined output of BRICS economic output of BRICS is actually equal to the combined output of G7. Uh, it's an astonishing figure, which was not the case until only a few years ago. So, so a significant part of the world economy having the uh, vested interest in underwriting the terms of a lasting peace. This is, this yeah, is what you were saying. But let me... Uh, uh, just since to you were, say, just to underscore, the G7 US, Canada, UK, France, Germany, Italy, and Japan is, according to the International Monetary Fund data, 31% of the world output. The BRICS, which is Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, is 32% of world output. Now, don't take these numbers to a decimal point, and there are lots of footnotes to add. This is using what's called purchasing power adjusted prices and so on. But the BRICS are a major part of the world. And geopolitically, really an important part of the world. And as we were discussing, for me, extremely interesting that the three countries in a row now 23, 2023, 2024, and 2025 of the G20 presidency, which is not a small thing because it's 85% of world output, those 20 countries, 19 countries plus EU, will be G, will be BRICS countries, actually. This year, India is the presidency of the G20. Next year, Brazil, and in 2025, South Africa, and last year was Indonesia. This is a different kind of world. It's not run by the G7 anymore. It's really run by a much broader group of nations, which is good. It means technology and prosperity and know-how has spread all over the world, which is exactly what we want. Yeah, but now this gets us into uh, into a big uh, into a big debate in the context of uh, of this technological progress and uh, and generally these uh, shifting geopolitical plates. Uh, there are authors, including in the last issue of the Horizons, that that argue that this war is actually just a prelude, is just an entry uh, into a much bigger and much fiercer, much more consequential competition of our times which is the competition between the United States 
in China. Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, one of the, um, in my opinion, most knowledgeable Westerners about China, which is uh, former uh, Prime Minister of Australia, Kevin Rudd, also one of the frequent visitors uh, of the CIRSD and a contributor to Horizons, wrote a fascinating piece in this, in this issue, uh, laying out 10 different scenario for the future of the United States-China relationship. And quite scaringly, I must say, eight out of those 10 scenarios envisage a war between the United States and China in our lifetime, which is possibly even more dangerous and even more consequential than the proxy war that uh, uh, we have been talking about uh, so far in this conversation. So Jeff, what is your view on the future of the U.S.-China relationship. Do you think that this, this coupling is uh, inevitable, that this trend cannot be reversed in? And what's currently after the, the big COVID drama that brought another you know, dimension uh, into, into this whole situation? Where do you think that the U.S.-China relationship is currently going? I'll start with, uh, again, the same data that I mentioned earlier, but for the US and China. If you measure output in China and the US at what's called international prices, a common set of prices, or what's called purchasing adjusted prices, the Chinese economy is bigger than the US economy. China is currently about 18% of world output and the U.S. is about 15.5% of world output. This is a fundamental change from 40 years ago. In 1980, the U.S. was about 21% of world output, and China was about 2.5% of world output. Between 1980 and 2020, China grew at a rate of nearly 10% per year. When you have economic growth at 10% per year, it means your economy doubles in size every seven years. So in 35 years, it doubles five times, or two times two times two times two times two, 32 time increase. And that's basically what happened with China. Why, by the way? because China started incredibly poor and it caught up to a significant extent. When you're poor, there's lots of headroom, electrification, education, building roads, building rail, and that's what China did extremely effectively for 40 years. Excellent economic management for 40 years. And now they didn't close the gap in living standards because the living standards by this measure that I keep referring to puts China at about 30% of the US level. But since China's four times the population, it makes it a larger economy in total. Well, let me just give you the upshot of this. This is freaking out American policymakers. It's what a psychologist or a psychiatrist would call a neurotic reaction. Because no one gave China the permission to be bigger than the United States. And that wasn't supposed to happen. In 1992, the US achieved unipolar status, the sole superpower. And that was supposed to last for many decades. And lo and behold, 30 years later, it ended. And the American reaction is, we are so smart, we are so good, we are so effective that China must really have cheated at every moment. And they really must be our enemy also. This is extremely dangerous. It's either us or them at the top of the world. And only a US-led world is a safe world. Otherwise, we're all going to be destroyed by China. It is, in my view, a fantasy 
misunderstanding. I'll start again with the basic proposition. China's living standards are about a third of the US. China has decades of economic development to make. China faces major challenges. Population is now starting to decline quite significantly. China will probably be under 1 billion people by the end of this century, possibly 800 million according to the UN forecasts, which are mechanical but still showing how significant. China will age very rapidly. There are many, many challenges. China's not out to take over the world. But the U.S. whole vision is U.S. is the world leader. It's the self-image. It's what I'm afraid is taught at the Kennedy School of Government often. Yeah. Isn't that right? Yeah, it was, it was, it was something it was, like that. It was in a different. You don't have to believe what's context. taught, but it is something that's taught. I, I actually did believe a lot of things that I was taught <laughs> at Harvard Kennedy School, and this is one of the reasons why Jeff and I remain so close uh, up to this day. But but the atmosphere uh, was different back uh, at a school. Uh, it was easier to disagree. It was it was a different uh, era. Uh, I really enjoyed my time at a very liberal and open institution that was Harvard at the time. Um, I did give a lecture last year at Harvard, and uh, although it wasn't really about the war in Ukraine, I was I was asked questions by the audience, by the by the kids in the audience, and. Um, I was very diplomatic. I, I wasn't. I wasn't like Jeff at all uh, tonight. Jeff was very. They, very they probably open. wouldn't invite me there. I, so yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, later on, I remember uh, we went for a, we went for a lunch. Uh, the professor and I. I'm not going to name who the professor was, but uh, she. Well, she. Uh, <laughs> she. Uh, that's a disguise. That's, that's it's deep a cover. little bit of a disguise. <laughs> She actually, we sat in Harvard Square, and she was whispering at me, saying, "Oh, you should not have said what you said. Are you?" Oh could? my word! And, and I said, "Like, I mean, I, I wasn't. I would, did not want to make a comment on that. But, but whispering in a restaurant at Harvard Square, like whispering, uh, I could imagine whispering, you know, in a place like Belgrade or maybe a place like Moscow, whispering, so they do not overhear what you say. But whispering at Harvard Square was something that really." struck me uh, that there was a, an era of change in comparison to, to the time when I was at Harvard. Uh, I had so many other questions to ask, uh, but uh, I'm not even going to go into the origins of the COVID uh, virus. I'm not going to go into the questions of who uh, blew up the Nord Stream, because it would have been too much uh, of me to ask under the circumstances. But I do want to give, like, uh, every time I do want to give a chance to the audience to ask questions uh, to Professor Sachs. He has to leave um, the uh, podium at uh, 6.55 because he has a brief uh, phone call to make. So it gives us about 12 to 13 minutes uh, of questions and, and the floor is open indeed. Uh, this is not Harvard, this is a free place so you can ask anything, anything you like. Uh, to Professor Jeffrey Sachs, there's there, and then for Mr. I, I'm going to give uh, a chance to Governor Shoshkic to ask the first question. Apologies to you guys in the back. Uh, former Governor of the Central Bank of Serbia, Great. Mr. Shoshkic. Thank you. Uh, First of all, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It was a pleasure to listen to your, your points. My question would be the following one. If we assume that this conflict is going to end in a way that's not going to be a defeat, an explicit defeat of Russia, do you see that having any consequences of the future role of dollar as an international currency? And what do you think is going to happen on the US Treasury bond market in the future? Thank you. Just a, in a general word about uh, the role of the U.S. dollar. It has been a source of a lot of U.S. power and prerogative. The fact that about 60% of world trade is denominated in dollars and settled 
in dollars, and the U.S. banking system is the predominant mechanism for clearing transactions. And the SWIFT system, which is how the U.S. banking system settles transactions, is uh, the instrument by which the U.S. excludes Russia, for example, under the sanctions. I believe that in 10 years from now, the role of the dollar will be much, much less than it is today. Uh, and in 20 years, we'll have a, a very different international monetary system. And the U.S. will have lost uh, what was called by uh, de Gaulle an exorbitant privilege, but it will have lost a privilege of having the key currency in the world. I think there are three reasons for this decline that will come that's already underway. One is that to be the world currency depends on being the predominant economy in the world. <clears throat> and as the U.S. share of the world economy diminishes, it's natural that the role of the U.S. dollar would diminish as well. And we are, as I said, on a gradual, gentle decline, not gentle, but gradual decline of the share of world output due to the U.S., not mainly because of the U.S. collapse, but mainly because the rest of the world develops economically, like China. So that's one reason. The second reason is much more pertinent to this uh, evening, and that is the U.S. began to weaponize the dollar roughly a decade ago. So it basically began to use the dollar as a geopolitical instrument. And my advice is if you are a government that isn't getting along too well with the U.S., hold your reserves in some other currency. Because the U.S. has developed a bad habit of seizing foreign exchange reserves of governments that it doesn't like. And it has done that with Venezuela, with Iran, with Afghanistan, with North Korea, and now with Russia. It views that as a, an easy thing to do. Stroke of a pen by the president and your antagonist, your foe, can't use their dollars anymore. We even did that with Afghanistan on the way out, seized all, froze all the foreign exchange reserves so that the economy completely collapsed in that impoverished place afterwards. It's nasty, by the way. But more than being nasty, it also is not something you can do over and over again because other countries start to say, maybe we'll hold our reserves in renminbi, thank you, or maybe we'll hold them in some other currency, thank you. And that's what's happening now. So that's a second reason for why the dollar will decline, because it's not just a money, it's an instrument of geopolitics, which it should not be. You can have one or the other, but you can't have the geopolitical instrument for very long. You won't have the key currency anymore. And the third is technological. I think that transactions will not be settled through commercial banks in the future in anything like the way they are now, because we will have digital central bank currencies and we don't need the commercial banks in the long term to settle our transactions. Probably the digital renminbi will be a first digital currency, probably for use within China, but then it will start to be expanded internationally. Several other central banks will make digital currencies. This is quite different from crypto. Crypto is you have an electronic account that's nonsense and you think it's going to hold value. It's Every day I wake up, sorry to say, if you're Bitcoin lovers, every day that Bitcoin has any value at all, I think the world's still crazy. <laughs> so uh, Bitcoin has no intrinsic value, and it's not a legal reserve currency for anything, and it's not a legal means of payment, and it's not a national fiat currency which can at least settle your debts uh, internally. It's unbelievable that people spend money for this electronic cipher and this arrest of this kid 
in the United States should tell you this is a little crazy. But what I'm talking about is something else, which is a central bank currency, because there a digital central bank currency is just a means of clearing payments rather than writing checks like we used to do, or even making electronic ledgers through Venmo we use in the United States and so forth, uh, whichever e-wallet system you use. The central bank can do that, actually. And I think that we'll go to that kind of settlements. And so the US ability to say, ah, we're going to cut you off from SWIFT, eh, so what? Uh, so I think in 10 years or 15 years from now, it'll be quite a different international monetary system. Thank you. One other question. The back in the audience, that's. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Andre, a student of the international relations. It's uh, really a pleasure to uh, listen to you again. I, uh, I was in the audience last time you were in Serbia. And uh, my question is, uh, what is your vision of uh, the role of Russia in the, the future in the conflict of uh, US and China? Thank you very much. The role of, of Russia in the conflict between the US and China. The role of Russia in the conflict. Yes. Look, uh, ba basically, um, ba basically, uh, much of the world, as I say, is going to have trade relations with China because <laughs> why not? It's, it's a good trading partner. And uh, China will be the world's main trading partner for a significant majority of the world. And Russia is among them and physically uh, being neighbors uh, so that Russia can make uh, gas and oil pipelines and provide uh, other raw materials which China doesn't have makes them very complementary economies. And since the US has designated both of them as enemies, it makes them natural allies. We, we did the one thing that Zbigniew Brzezinski said, never do. Uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski was uh, you know, the uh, geopolitical strategist who in 1997 said how important Ukraine was for this geopolitical competition. But in his book, The Global Chessboard, he says, well, this will be the geographical pivot of Eurasia. But the one thing the United States must never do is drive China and Russia together. Uh, and, and then he says, but this is very unlikely to happen. Uh, and so, you know, it's uh, the US, you shouldn't declare enemies this way. Uh, it, make, it doesn't even make sense on your own terms uh, of your own geopolitical competition. Uh, and that was, you know, that was Nixon's idea of triangulating between Russia and China, or Soviet Union and China, uh, during the Cold War period. But we did what we were told, oh, that will never happen because it's such a bad idea. So right now, that is a, a friendship without limits, as they say, because the US is targeting both of them. And the US is talking the European Union into more and more of an anti-China policy. And I just can't believe it that Europe would fall for this. Because Europe absolutely for its prosperity needs a good relationship with China. And for a long time in the future, China will be a neighbor of Europe in Eurasia. And so you're actually on the same landmass too. And so having good relations would be a good thing, but not in the US mindset. And so the US has launched a chips war against China. You know, this is incredible, this chips war, just to, oh my God. I need an hour to say what I wanted to yeah, say, but I'll yeah. say it in, I'll say it in, uh, in one minute. There's one more the, question. The U.S. So has why. said, we're going to try to stop the Chinese economy from you know, modernizing at the front level by restricting the sale of advanced chips. Terrible idea, in my view. Completely belligerent. But yesterday, Apparently, according to the Financial Times, I don't know whether it's definitive or not, Netherlands said, we go along with this. If Europe just follows the US on this, it's not going to defeat 
China, but it sure is going to boomerang against Europe. It makes no sense. And what Europe should be saying to the United States is, calm down. You're still powerful. We still like you. You don't have to, you know, you're still richer than China per capita. You can calm down. We don't want a war with China, too. And that's what Europe should really be saying to the United States for its own Thank good. you, Jeff. But there's one more question. And uh, I, I, really, I really have to, to make a, an exception, because I, I really don't know what would have happened if I don't allow this. But my wife actually wants to ask a question. It this is a catches me by surprise. So <laughs> Natasha Yeremich wants to ask a question. <laughs> situation uh, on climate change? Okay, an easy question. Easy. <laughs> Current situation on climate change. It's hot and getting hotter fast. <laughs> and just to give you, uh, to, to give you a, a couple of uh, grim realities on this, the rate of warming of Earth on average has been 0.18 degrees Celsius per decade during the last 30 years. So that means that Earth has warmed by about half of one degree C over the past 30 years. Earth is now warming currently at about twice that rate, at about 0.36 degrees Celsius per decade. Now compared to the pre-industrial temperature, the Earth is 1.2 degrees warmer than it was before industrialization. If you take 0.36 degrees C per decade, that means we'll be 1.56 degrees Celsius warmer than pre-industrial 10 years from now. That means we will be above the limit set in the Paris Agreement within 10 years. And according to my favorite climatologist, Dr. James Hansen, who I've relied on for decades, and he's been right on everything he's told me for decades, he thinks that in, a, yeah, in the next few years, when we go from the La Nina cycle in the Pacific Ocean to an El Nino, which raises the Earth's temperature on what's called an interannual basis, we could have an excess beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius, the Paris limit, within the next five years, the next big El Nino. We're in a La Nina right now. All of this is to say, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any doubt at all about global warming, it's real, it's serious, it's accelerating, and it's going to create a terrible mess no matter what we do. But if we don't do what we need to do, it's going to create a catastrophic mess. Thank you. Anna, I mean, I got to thank you. Thank you very much. I got to end on the positive note. There is a cocktail. And the drinks are on the CIRSD. We have to end on a positive note. Jeff is going to leave us right now for a call, but he's going to come back and join us in some uh, 20 minutes to half an hour. Thank you once again, Jeff. This was fascinating. Not everybody agreed, I'm sure, with everything that you had said, but. <laughs>